all of you have been kind of a little bit distracted, I'd like to tell you about a miracle. Not quite a miracle. And if I've told you this story before, you can politely listen and chalk it up as the bishop's getting a little bit of Alzheimer's or something. He repeats himself. Uh, we talked about in the morning mass about some miracles, modern miracles. And uh, I remember 1987 or 88, uh, something very unique was happening when I offered Mass. When I was in Omaha, at home offering Mass, the host tasted the same. But when I traveled and my Mass circuit, it tasted sweet. And I'm thinking, no, don't look for signs and wonders. That only happens to holy people, and you're not holy. I know that, so we're not going to... But it kept bothering me. It tastes sweet. How do I, how do I explain that? And it's, it really started to be something I noticed more and more. At home, host tasted the no taste, but on the road it tasted sweet. What is going on? And so I'm trying to make my Thanksgiving after mass, but I was thinking, where is it coming from? Like, dear God, help me. What's going on in my life? And then I figured, wait a minute. When I travel, we have a container, a large host, small host. So I asked Sister Mischild, I says, uh, can I see the container with the host in it? I looked at it. I said, where'd you get this container? So was Sister So-and-So's. She used to keep her dentures in there. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I said, give me the container. Threw it away. I says, I mean, we're scraping by for money, but we could sure as heck buy a $1 container for putting a host in there. So no signs and wonders today, okay? Just want to share that with you. Okay, uh, moving right along with one of the things, uh, or a couple of things, we've, we've treated quite a number of things, but wanted to uh, speak about in history, there are two names that come up with regard to the papacy. And these names especially came up at Vatican Council I. Now, Vatican Council I dealt with the faith, condemned rationalism, and also got into the papacy and papal infallibility. One of the reasons why Vatican I got into papal infallibility was because of a thing called Gallicanism. Gallicanism was an erroneous belief coming from Gaul or France primarily. It was the erroneous opinion that the Pope is infallible only when he teaches with the totality of bishops, all the bishops. So if he's not teaching with all the bishops, he's not infallible. It's only when he has all the bishops collegiately teaching with him that he's infallible. And Vatican I, when you read the history of it, there were three, the bishops were divided into three camps. Number one, the first camp was those bishops who said, yes, we need to define papal infallibility. Second group, those bishops and cardinals, whoever, who said, we need to define it, but not today, now is not the right time. And then there was a very, very, very tiny small group that says, no, we shouldn't define this at all. 
Interestingly, the Masons in Europe were especially trying to throw out misinformation about papal infallibility and that the Pope is supposedly always infallible and he's impeccable and he can't commit a sin and everything that comes out of his mouth is infallible, etc., etc. So they're trying to exaggerate and confuse the issue. But Pope Pius IX, when he addressed this issue, <clears throat> when he defined papal infallibility, he said, we with this council of bishops. I'm not just giving you paraphrasing. So he basically met the Gallicans at their what their conditions were for infallibility. We with the you know, well, all the bishops teach that the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra. Now, what is ex cathedra? When he speaks from the chair, he's speaking as the supreme head of the church. Remember how we said. If the, pre, if the Pope gives a, a particular command, a particular order, tells you to commit sin, or you should do that which is wrong, sin for against the common good of the church, you can disobey him. Because he's not impeccable. He can commit sin. But when he speaks ex cathedra as the head of the church, that means he's teaching as the supreme head. He's addressing the universal church It's a matter of faith and morals. And he's defining, he's making it very clear, this is it. Now some people think that when they think of ex cathedra, it has to be solemn. Trumpets blasting and it's you know something very, very solemn and etc., etc. That is not true. Theologians say that even in an encyclical, the Pope can exercise his infallible authority and teach ex cathedra. And in fact, Pope Pius XII, when he uh, issued Humani Generis, he condemned those who would belittle encyclical, saying, well, oh, it's only just an encyclical. We can take it or reject it. Pope Pius XII said, even in an encyclical, when the Pope doesn't exercise the full authority of his teaching office, nevertheless, the words of Christ, he who hears you, hears me, are still verified. And if the Pope settles a matter up to this time that was controversial, it's no longer open for theologians to discuss it. The matter is finished. But my point is this, and this is part of Satan's deception to many, many traditional Catholics, and that is that if you believe that the chair is vacant, zero sede vacantist, they try to miss... Um, misinform people that supposedly you don't believe in the papacy. And that is totally opposite. It's because we believe in the papacy as Christ established it that we believe that the Pope, number one, has to be a Catholic. He can't be a heretic. Number two is that when he speaks, he's speaking on Christ's behalf to the universal church on matters of faith and morals. And that's where we get into another area, and that is the what are the areas of infallibility? And I'd like to, before I get into that, get back to Vatican I. There were two popes at Vatican I that needed to be discussed. One was Pope <clears throat> Liberius, and the other one was Pope Honorius. Now I do have... I <clears throat> hope I can find it here. And we spread it all out so we wouldn't lose it. <clears throat> We're really in constraint for time here. <clears throat> there was a Cardinal Henry Manning at Vatican Council I. He was a leading Cardinal who wanted to say, we need to define papal infallibility. The heck with the secular press. The heck with the Masons trying to confuse issues. We need to define this. But Cardinal... Manning wrote a book about Vatican Council I, and this is he talks about the case of Honorius. I've intentionally refrained. You know what? I can actually show this. I'm not sure if it's, it's big enough here. We can turn the lights off. We actually show this to you. Uh, rather than me read it, we can read it all together. Oh boy, it's going to be not easy to read. Try to focus that. But if we turn the lights off, we might be able to get a better view of this. 
<clears throat> I have intentionally refrained from treating of the, the historical evidence in the case of Honorius in the text of the fourth chapter for the following reasons. Because it is sufficient to the argument that the chapter to affirm that the case of Honorius is doubtful. It is in vain for the antagonists of papal infallibility to quote this case as if it were certain. And I know those of you on the side can't see because of this board. We'll move this over. Centuries of controversy have established beyond contradiction that the accusation against Honorius cannot be raised by his most ardent antagonists to more than a probability. And this probability at maximum is less than a, that of his defense. I therefore affirm the question to be doubtful, which is abundantly sufficient against the private judgment of the, his accusers. The cumulus of evidence for infallibility of Roman pontiff outweighs all such doubts. Now let's get right to the meat of the matter because we're going to run out of time here. First, Honorius defined no doctrine whatsoever. Second, that he forbade the making of any new definition. Third, that his fault was precisely in his, this omission of the apostolic authority for which he was justly censured. Fourth, that his two epistles are entirely orthodox, though, and the use of language he wrote as was usual before the condemnation of the monothelitism and not as becomes necessary afterwards. Now, what is the issue at hand? There was a heretic by the name of Sergius who was promoting a heresy, and he was able to get Pope Honorius to do nothing not to condemn him, not to speak and say exactly what the church teaches, Honorius did nothing. And because he did nothing, Sergius was able to spread his heresy pretty far and wide. And those who are against papal infallibility would try to use Honorius as an example of how he promoted heresy and he was still the pope. And that's not true at all. As he says, his epistles, Honorius' epistles, were perfectly orthodox but he was condemned later. Now this is interesting because I talked to somebody from the Society of St. Pius X on this very issue. And he says, well, of course, Honorius was a heretic. And we still recognize him. He's still on the list of popes. I said, he wasn't a heretic. Oh, yes, he was. Read the Catholic Encyclopedia. I said, we'll get it out. You get the Catholic Encyclopedia out. And he goes on and on and on. And I kept interrupting, listening for heresy. I don't hear heresy. He got to the end of the whole section. I said, that makes my point all the more stronger. They did not condemn him for heresy. A later council condemned Honorius for his negligence in defining, using his authority to put an end to this heresy. He was condemned because he didn't do anything. The other ex example is Pope Liberius. Pope Liberius was imprisoned and while in prison, they, they, they came out and said, oh, he signed this, look everybody, he promoted this heresy, etc., etc. Number one, it's doubtful whether he signed it. Number two, he was certainly not a free man. And number three, when he got out, as soon as he got out, he condemned the very thing that he supposedly signed. And number four, if you really look at what was said, what was written, it was not heresy. It was ambiguous, but it wasn't heresy and it could be interpreted in a perfectly orthodox manner. But those who imprisoned the Pope were trying to squeeze out of him some type of acceptance of what they were trying to say. So what Liberius supposedly signed of itself was not heretical, it was ambiguous, could take of two different interpretations. You can read it and say, yeah, this is perfectly orthodox. But if, if you're on the other side, you could probably interpret it some other way. We don't know if he signed it. Number two, he wasn't a free person. He was imprisoned. Would he sign it under duress? We don't know. It's very doubtful whether he signed it. But when he did get free, he sure as the first thing he did was condemn that heresy. So these are the two you know, issues that came up at Vatican Council I to try to, how would you say, oppose papal infallibility. But it's been long explained that they were not heretics. And not being heretics... Uh, you know, it all the more supports the condemnation of Gallicanism and Vatican I's definition that the Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra, is infallible. Now, there's another important issue, and that is this. 
We'll get into this issue of infallibility very, very quickly here. And uh, I want to um, show two things here. Take this off. Who are the possessors of infallibility? The Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra, and the totality of bishops is infallible. All the bishops together, when they either assembled in a general council or scattered over the whole earth, propose a teaching of faith and morals as one to be beheld by all the faithful. This comes up with two things here. <clears throat> one of the things that comes to my mind is those who try to say that Vatican Council II was only a pastoral council, that it was not a uh, dogmatic council. That's not true. And in fact, when Paul VI was asked, who signed Vatican II in 1965, by what authority are these teachings being proposed? He said, at least by the ordinary universal teaching authority of the church, meaning the bishops in union with the Pope, teaching uh, the universal church. So when those who try to argue, oh, it was only pastoral council, Vatican II didn't teach anything infallibly, it could have taught all those errors and still been an ecumenical council. No, you have all the totality of bishops together teaching in union with Paul VI. They're promoting things that have been condemned in the past. It shows they were not infallible. But who's the key to infallibility? The Pope. The Pope is infallible when he speaks ex cathedra as supreme head of the church. And the totality of bishops, they are also infallible when they teach in union with the Pope. But they're not by themselves infallible. They have to teach in union with the Pope to be infallible. In fact, if there's an ecumenical council in session and the Pope dies, ecumenical council is suspended, they have to elect the Pope. So, having said that, <clears throat> like to cover the two aspects of infallibility. And these are very important because of the fact that some people limit infallibility. And like I say, this is the preposterous thing. They say, well, you don't believe in the papacy. No, we know what the papacy is. We know how Christ established the papacy. And we know how Christ established the church. For you to say that is the Catholic church, even though they're teaching false ecumenism, practicing it publicly, officially, they're promoting an invalid mass and doubtful sacraments and canon laws, they're issuing canon laws, legislating to people things that are heretical and condemned and would lead to a loss of faith. You believe in a fallible church. You believe in a fallible pope. You don't believe in the papacy exactly the way Christ established a papacy. So contrary, very contrary to the very things that you're saying, on the contrary, it's because I believe in the papacy, because I believe in papal infallibility, because I believe in the infallibility of the church, there is no way that that monstrosity that calls itself the church is the Catholic church. Primary aspect, or object of infallibility. The primary object of infallibility is each and every religious truth contained formally in the sources of revelation, sacred scripture and tradition. That's the primary object of the church's infallibility. Secondary object. <clears throat> the secondary object of infallibility comprises all those matters which are closely connected with revel revealed deposit that revelation itself will be imperiled unless an absolutely certain decision could be made about them. And they get into the details. Where do they fall into for secondary object infallibility? Theological conclusions, dogmatic facts, the general discipline of the church, the approval of religious orders, the canonization of saints. This is the secondary object of infallibility, and this is right along the lines of why we must reject these men that they're not true popes. When it comes to the area of canon law, those are universal laws. In 1983, when John Paul II said non-Catholics can go to communion without abjuring their error, without coming back to the faith, that is against 
the teachings of Christ against divine law. It's been, been condemned by the church. And you know what? I, I did not put that uh, point up there. I can just quickly find it here in the midst of... Let's see here. Here it is. There it was. This is what the church taught previously. This is 1917 code, the second canons. And this is canon 731. Since all the sacraments of the new law instituted by Christ our Lord are the principal means of sanctification and salvation, the greatest care and reverence must be used in administration and the reception of them at the right time and in the right way. Part of the code, 1973, uh, 731, excuse me, 1917 code, canon 731. It is forbidden to administer the sacraments of the church to heretics or schismatics, even though they are in good faith and request the sacraments, unless they have previously renounced their errors and obtained reconciliation with the church. So, in the area of, of infallibility, if we could just cover this very, very quickly here, just to verify what we're saying about the secondary object of infallibility, general legislation, and also the liturgy. The church's infallibility extends to the general discipline of the church. This proposition is theologically certain. As ecclesiastical laws pass for universal church for the direction of Christian worship and Christian living. The phrase before it, lower it down, the church's infallibility extends to general discipline of the church. By the term general discipline are meant those ecclesiastical laws pass for the universal church for the direction of Christian worship and Christian living. The imposing of commands belongs not directly to the teaching office, but to the ruling office. Disciplinary laws are only indirectly an object of infallibility, only by reason of the doctrinal decision implicit in them. When the church's rulers sanction a law, they implicitly make a twofold judgment. This law squares with church's doctrine on faith and morals, that is, imposes nothing that is at odds with sound belief and good morals. And this amounts to a doctrinal decree. The law, considering all the circumstances, is most opportune. The church's infallibility in disciplinary matters, when understood in this way, harmonizes beautifully with the mutability of even universal laws. For a law, even though it be thoroughly consonant with the revealed truth, can, given a change of circumstance, become less timely or less even useless, so that prudence may dictate the abrogation or ratification. The proof of infallibility. The church is endowed with infallibility that it might safeguard the whole of Christ's doctrine and be for all men a trustworthy teacher of the Christian way of life. But if the church could make a mistake in a matter alleged, when it legislated for general discipline, it would be no longer a loyal guardian of revealed doctrine or a trustworthy teacher of the Christian way of life. It would not be a guardian of the revealed truth, for the imposition of a vicious law would be, for all practical purpose, tantamount to an erroneous, uh, dis er erroneous definition. <clears throat> Let me see if I can find this here. I got too many papers up here. You know, uh, the gist of it is, <clears throat> if I could find this, give me a second here. Got too many papers here right now. Well, you know what I'm going to have to tell you is that I have mixed this in the pile and I'm not seeing it immediately. But you get the gist of it. The gist of it is the church's infallibility primarily is sacred scripture and tradition. Secondarily, when she imposes laws, when she approves of the liturgy. There's a saying in Latin, the law of prayer, lex orande 
is the law of believing, lex credendi. As you pray, so you believe. The liturgy, the mass, the sacraments are protected by infallibility so that how we worship and those things that the church has de defined or determined, this is how you pray, this is how you administer the sacraments, they, can com they cannot contain any error. And yet we know with the Novus Ordo and with regard to the, the, the sacraments, there are serious doubts. Um, I would like to just briefly touch upon those, uh, those areas real quickly here. We already talked about a false ecumenism, religious liberty, in the area of the, the Mass, the modern Mass, the Novus Ordo. <clears throat> We've covered this so many times in the past. A very good expose would be Cardinal Atiavani, the Atiavani intervention. It's at the center in which they critique the Novus Ordo in whole and in part and say it's a striking departure from the Mass as defined by, as the, by the Council of Trent. The main part is this. They went from sacrifice to a Protestant meal. As you know, in 1969, that special commission that came out with the Novus Ordo, they had Protestant advisors there. And when they were done, they said, we can use the Mass, the Catholic Mass now, because it doesn't represent sacrifice. The reference, the notion of sacrifice to atone for sin has been completely taken out. That was 1969. Another problem is 1968 where they changed the, the form for the consecration of bishops. We've talked about this before. We're just going to touch on it very briefly. They rendered the form ambiguous just like had happened in England under Edward VI and Cramner and the aftermath of that was Pope Leo XIII says the Anglicans, Anglican Church, do not have valid priests or bishops because they altered the form and rendered it ambiguous. The very thing that was happening under Edward VI and Cramner in England was the very thing that happened in 1968 where they rendered the form for the consecration of bishops ambiguous. Very similar to what was happening in in. Uh, and it would happen in England for which Pope Leo XIII said that they don't have valid orders. What does this lead us to if we look at all these things com collectively? The problem is, is this. We are living in very difficult times, but this is so widespread. It's not like in Germany it was this Lutheran, Lutheranism and Martin Luther in Germany or in England with Henry VIII and you know, a schism and eventually Protestantism, English Protestantism. We're looking about something that's happening and has happened worldwide. And for this, we need to once again be objective and not be deceived by Satan about what the reality and the world and what the reality of the church is. We don't look at the numbers. We don't look at the, the outward appearances. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, when the Son of God came down from heaven, and the Magi, the three kings, came to worship him, what faith they had. Come to a poor stable, see a poor couple, a baby in a manger on straw, and falling down, they worshipped him. These men had a strong and lively faith. They looked at the objective evidence, not the outward appearances. When Jesus was dying on the cross, his mother, St. Mary Magdalene, St. John the Evangelist, a few of the holy women, most of the, everyone was against Jesus, blaspheming him, mocking him, outwardly looked like you know, he wasn't the Son of God. Outwardly looked like his enemies conquered him. And, and yet, objectively, you know, he was the victor. He was the conqueror by redeeming us, being the Lamb of God, to redeem us of our sins. And he rose on the third day. And so, in, the, in these times, don't be fooled by appearances. What does the objective evidence show us? Now, there is something, I know we're going to run out of time here, but I wanted to really touch upon this. Uh, I think it is very apropos. There is a book on uh, 
list of what's called Trotty books. Uh, they have some pretty good books there. But we were talking about Cardinal Manning. And uh, he wrote a book called The Pope and the Antichrist. Uh, this is a reproduction of the cover. The Present Crisis of the Holy See, Tested by Prophecy, Four Lectures, Henry, Henry Edward Manning, D.D. He was Cardinal. And one of the interesting, it's not the whole book, it was, it's probably a book of 120 pages, not heavy reading, very good reading, but interesting reading. I hope I can touch upon this very quickly. You know, if we could turn off the lights, I might be able to see better. This is probably the clearest I can get it. Now we're just jumping, what page is this? This page is uh, da, 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 72. Right here on number three. This leads on plainly to the marks which the prophet gives of the persecution of the last days. There are three things which he has recorded. In the foresight of the prophecy, he saw and noted these three things. First, that the continual sacrifice shall be taken away. The next, that the sanctuary will be occupied by the abomination which maketh desolate. And third, that the strength and the stars, which he, as he described, shall be cast down. And these are the only three I notice. I will notice. Now, first of all, what is this taking away of the continual sacrifice? It was taken away in type at the destruction of Jerusalem. The sacrifice of the temple, that is, of the lamb, morning and evening, and the temple of God was entirely abolished with the destruction of the temple itself. Now the prophet Malachi says, from the rising of the sun, even to the going down, my name is great among the Gentiles. And in every place there is sacrifice, and there is offered to my name a clean oblation. This passage of the prophet has been interpreted by the father of the church, beginning with St. Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, and I know not how many besides to be the sacrifice of the Holy Eucharist, the true Paschal Lamb, which came into place of the type, namely the sacrifice of Jesus himself on Calvary, renewed perpetually and continued forever in the sacrifice on the altar. Now has that continual sacrifice been taken away? That which was typified of old and of it in the old days has already been taken away. But has the reality been taken away? The Holy Fathers who have written upon the subject of Antichrist and of these prophecies of Daniel without a single exception, as far as I know, they are both the fathers of both the East and the West, the Greek and the Latin Church, all of them unanimously say that in the latter end of the world, during the reign of Antichrist, the holy, sac holy sacrifice of the altar will cease. And the work on the end of the world described to St. Hippolytus, after a long description of the afflictions of the last days, we read as follows. The church shall lament with great lamentation. For there shall be no, offered no more the oblation, nor incense, nor worship acceptable to God. The sacred buildings of the churches shall be as hovels, and the precious body and blood of Christ shall not be manifest in those days. The liturgy will, shall be extinct. The chanting of the Psalms cease. The reading of Holy Scripture shall be heard no more. And there shall be upon men darkness and mourning upon mourning and woe upon woe. This is one of the first things I wanted to mention about. Uh, let's see. It's nothing like dropping your notes and getting them scattered here. That was 73. As they say, Haste makes moist. We're going to get right to another meat of the matter here. If we could find us quickly. Give me a second. Thank you. Seventy-six. I apologize when we threw this or drop this folder kind of things got scattered. 80, 80, 81, and 82. That's it. Okay. I find this very fascinating what Cardinal Manning in the 1800s wrote. The writers of the church tell us 
then in the latter times the city of Rome will probably become apostate from the church and from the vicar of Jesus Christ, that Rome will again be punished. For he will depart from it and the judgment of God will fall in the place from which he once reigned over the nations of the world. For what is it that makes Rome sacred but the presence of the vicar of Jesus Christ? What has it that should be dear in the sight of God only save the presence of the vicar of his son? Let the church of Christ depart from Rome and Rome will no more in the eyes of God when Rome will be, uh, be, will be no more in the eyes of God than Jerusalem of old. Jerusalem, the holy city, chosen by God, was cast down and consumed by fire because it crucified the Lord of glory. And the city of Rome, which has been the seat of the vicar of Jesus Christ for 1,800 years, if it become apostate like Jerusalem of old, will suffer a like condemnation. And therefore, the writers of the church tell us that the city of Rome has no prerogative except only that the vicar of Christ is there. And if it become unfaithful, the same judgments which fell on Jerusalem, hollow though it was by the presence of the Son of God, of the master and not the disciple only shall fall up likewise upon Rome. The apostasy of the city of Rome from the vicar of Christ and its destruction by Antichrist may be thought so new to many Catholics that I think it well to recite the text of theologians of great, greatest repute. And he goes through this Melvenda and then he goes through, he talks about Suarez, Bar, uh, Bellarmine, etc. That Rome shall apostatize from the faith, drive away the vicar of Christ, and once again we return to its ancient paganism. In the time of Antichrist, Rome shall be destroyed, as we see openly in the 13th chapter of the Apocalypse. And the woman whom thou sawest is the great city, which hath kingdom over the kingdoms, or the kings of the earth, in which is signified Rome and its impiety such as it was in the time of St. John, and shall be again at the end of the world. St. Robert Bellarmine, in the time of Antichrist, Rome shall be desolate and burnt, as we learn from the 16th verse of the 17th chapter of the Apocalypse. On the words of the Jesuit, Eberman comments as follows. We all confess what word Bellarmine that the Roman people, a... a little before the end of the world, return to paganism and drive out the Roman pontiff. The Rome in the last age of the world, after it has apostatized from the faith, will attain a great to great power and splendor of wealth and its, and its sway shall be spread throughout the world and, fl and gr flourish greatly. Cornelius Alapide, commenting on the 18th chapter of the Apocalypse, these things are to be understood of the city of Rome, not that which is, nor that which was, but that which shall be at the end of the world. For then the city of Rome will return to its former glory, and likewise its idolatry and other sins, and shall be such as it was in the time of St. John under Nero, Domitian, and Dacius. For from Christian it shall begin, be, become heathen, it shall cast out the Christian pontiff and the faithful to adhere to him, it shall persecute and slay them. It shall rival the persecutions of the heathen emperors against the Christians. For so we see Jerusalem was the first heathen under the Canaanites, secondly, faithful under the Jews, and thirdly, Christian under the uh, apostles, and fourthly, heathen under the Ro Romans, fifthly, Saracen under the Turks. Such, they believe, will be the history of Rome. Pagan under the emperors, Christian under the apostles, faithful under the pontiffs, apostate, under the revolution. There's another book that was interesting. I think we've shared this with you before. And I apologize because we're doing this quite quickly, but there was a commentary written on the Apocalypse by a priest by the name of Sylvester Berry.
We're going to try to just randomly cover these quotes here. He basically is re he r writes out the each chapter of the Apocalypse, then comments on it. This is chapter 12. In the foregoing chapter, St. John outlines the history of the church from the beginning or the coming of Antichrist to the end of the world in order to give a connection, a connected account of the two prophets, Elias and Henoch, or Moses, and the results of their labors. It shall be a war unto death between the church and the powers of darkness in the final effort of Satan to destroy the church and thus prevent the universal reign of Christ on earth. Satan will first attempt to destroy the power of the papacy and to bring about the downfall of the church through heresies, schisms, and persecutions that must surely follow. Failing in this, he will then attack the church from without. For this purpose, he will raise up Antichrist and his prophet to lead the faithful into error and destroy those who remain steadfast. The church, the faithful spouse of Jesus Christ, is represented as a woman clothed in the glory of divine grace. We're not going to be able to read this whole thing, but we're going to try to cover as much as we can. Okay. So it talks about this vision of St. John. The church is ever in labor to bring forth children unto eternal life. And the sad days here predicted, the sorrows and pains of delivery shall be increased many fold. In this passage, there is an evident allusion to a, some particular son of the church whose power and influence shall be such that Satan will seek to destroy his destruction at any cost. This person can be none other than the Pope to be elected in those days. The papacy will be attacked by all the powers of hell. In consequence, the church will suffer great trials and afflictions in securing a successor upon the throne of Peter. The words of St. Paul to the Thessalonians may be a reference to the papacy as an obstacle to the coming of the Antichrist. 